Welcome to A New and Ancient Story, a show dedicated to the transformation of self and society. We're moving from the story of separation to a new story of interbeing. We explore it all, technology, spirituality, agriculture, healing, economics, politics, ecology, relationships, education, because the changes that are gathering today will leave no aspect of our world untouched. For deeper engagement with these ideas, join our community at newandancientstory.net. So here I am, Charles Eisenstein again, uh, today joined by Julio Alaya, who is a legend in the coaching world. We're both at a conference here, and uh, <laughs> here, of course, everybody knows what coaching is. Some people might not even have any idea or only a vague idea about what coaching is, but I don't even know if we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, boy, I don't even have a good intro. Um, I mean, you can, I'm not going to do the bio, the mm -hmm. bio biography thing. You can look them up online. Um, but, um, Julio is someone I really like feel deeply speaks my language. Um, and someone who makes me, who reminds me that I'm not crazy. <laughs> um, today, I'm just going to jump in with an yeah. invitation. Um, you spoke a lot about uh, gratitude today. Mm -hmm. How did you learn about gratitude? I cannot call a specific moment or issue. But I, my sense is that I learn it from my students. Because one of the things that has happened, and it did happen today again, is that they come to me to say, I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful. So in some moment, it was impossible not to listen to the word. Mm -hmm. And um, w what does it mean? And of course, I entered into it, and it was a huge, huge, beautiful surprise. Because we have learned to live with the gift of life in the following way. Well, I deserve that. I deserve this. And I deserve that. And I work hard for it, so I deserve it. But the question that came to me when I thought of that is, deserve what? Do I deserve the children I have? Mm -hmm. Or I should say simply, wow. Well, how grateful I am for their existence. Do I deserve my wife? Or I should simply say, I'm so grateful for her to be there. Do I deserve my students? So, in some moment, any pretense of deserve, deserving disappear. Which is kind of the opposite of a lot of kind of new age teaching, which says that you're supposed to affirm your deservingness. Yeah. You know that, and, but like, what about accepting it even if you don't deserve it? Yeah. You know, like, did I did I work really hard to deserve my health and be yeah. able to breathe and having the sun shine? Like, is that do I get to take credit for the sun? You know, <laughs> it would be a little pretentious, wouldn't it? It would. <laughs> yeah, for for me, the, there's some easiness. For instance, when people are grateful and come to me to say thank you, I truly appreciate that. And at the same time, I believe the gratitude goes to something a lot bigger, of course, than myself. Um, so I take it, I hold it, I'm honored by it, and at the same time, I think it goes to a higher place for which my job is to simply listen and articulate. So I just had a thought here. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you talk about a lot of the same things I do about changing our deep mythology. Yeah. Um, so I was just thinking, of, thinking about gratitude and in the kind of standard um, scientific worldview, mm -hmm. there is actually no cause for gratitude oh. because the forces of nature and the events of life are fundamentally random. Yep. Therefore, anything good in this world has to come through our efforts. Either that or you're just lucky. So I guess you could be gratitude for random luck. You can be yeah. grateful for random luck, but that's not the same as being grateful for a gift. Yeah. yeah. So 
Mm. In, in essence, we live in a worldview that excludes the possibility of gratitude. Yeah. Well, actually, imagine I am grateful for the air I breathe, for the water I drink. I walk into a room in my home and I turn on the, the, the faucet and water comes. Is this a miracle? Mm -hmm. And I take it absolutely for granted. If, wow, but I said, you know what? This precious is it, phenomenon, this precious water is just there. How can I not be grateful? Well, I can say I work hard to deserve it, but come on. Um, you didn't invent chemistry, for example. I didn't invent <laughs> yeah. chemistry to say. But, but there's something in gratitude that your question provoked me to think, which is, when we say thank you, we say who I'm thanking for. Like, do I need a God to thank? I don't know if we need a God in the traditional religious sense of God, but this humility in gratitude mm -hmm. is, is truly the re when I revere something higher than myself, regardless what name I can put to it. But gratitude comes Gratitude is always a wonderful step to our humbleness, to humility. But when I say thank you, truly I surrender to the majesty of something larger, whatever, I don't know, and I, I don't know, whatever mention, whatever way we mention. Right, because the state of gratitude is a state of knowing that you've received a gift. Yep. So it's not something that you did yep. or that you created. Um, and to be in that state, I think that there has to be some sense that there is a giver that is beyond oneself, exactly. therefore humility. Yes. It brings to mind, um, I heard a beautiful, beautiful speech by David White. Yeah. Uh, and he, he was describing a visit he had to some like Scottish fisherman or some very traditional person yeah. Maybe in the Hebrides, some you know, who is really still indigenous in a way, yeah. and he said this this man lived his life in constant prayer. Yeah. There was a prayer for getting out of bed in the morning. Yeah. There was a prayer for opening the blinds and letting the sun in. There was a prayer for lighting the hearth. Yeah. A prayer for for breaking your first piece of bread, for walking out the door, for getting into your boat. Yeah. Like that only makes sense if there's something listening to your prayers. Yeah. And a lot of the prayers are prayers of gratitude. Yeah. So that man is not alone in the universe. Yeah. That's another dimension of gratitude. He breaks loneliness. Mm -hmm. You are in touch with something majestic, whatever it is again. But also besides humility and that sense, gratitude brings with it the, the, let me put it this way. Gratitude is a, is a deep emotion we may feel, right? And as every emotion put you in a place to, uh, to act in a particular manner. The other side of gratitude is that when I am in gratitude, my desire to be of service is absolutely present. So gratitude is not just, oh, I say it to the world, and it is that too, and I feel it off. But it immediately put me in a sense that I want to respond to the gift with being myself a gift. Mm -hmm. So gratitude creates a disposition in the world that otherwise we lack. I want to serve you, and I want to serve others, those who I love. I don't want to serve this planet. So why I want to serve? To make your money? No, no, no. Forget any other. I want to serve to respond to the gift I just received. It's that sense of, of service that comes from gratitude. And, and this, is, you know, this is related to something else you were talking about, that, that most people, when they see results in their lives they don't like, right. or a society sees results it doesn't yeah. like, they say, well, we have to change our actions yeah. that produce the results. But you're saying that that usually fails because usually the change in the action is something else that's already on your existing menu of actions that yep. you've already tried before. Usually it means just working harder. Yep. So you get some different version of the same results or maybe even exactly the same results or even worse. Yeah. 
And you're offering, well, the actions come from a worldview, come from a state of being. What if we changed that instead? Yeah. So part of the, and I, I kind of talk about the same thing, you know, in terms of the story that we live in and, and a transition into the story of gift. So this, when, when you, when, when anybody is in gratitude, like you're saying, every perception is different and every response to a situation is different. It colors your whole world. Yeah. And the things that we try so hard to, to achieve become either irrelevant yeah. or they become effortless. Yeah. The, the, the sense of, um, the, the, can we put it, this desire to do more, to work harder, to, to the, comes from a place of blindness. Hmm. See, if I don't like my results, as you were pointing to, let's do something. I want to work harder, more hours, that out. But if my view of the world doesn't change, I am trapped in a pattern. It will be a little different here and there, but that's basically what it will be. But you know what? The other thing, when I said, what if I change my view? The perception I have of the world, that the way I see it, the observer I am, that requires a profound act mm -hmm. of reflection. Because first of all, most of us are completely unaware that we are observers of a particular kind. We think I see because the kind of guy I am. And surprise, surprise, I will be seeing very different if I had been born in a different place in the family. But in any way, that, so the, the fact that we don't go to other place to change our result is not because we are not intelligent or nice or whatever. It's not coming from any particular intention. It does, it does come from blindness. We, what else? I need to do something different. But the, we, we are so taken by the drift in which we live that we don't, it's not even part of our thinking to, to get out of the drift. And that act, the profound act of awareness of the drift in which I am caught, which for me is transparent, by the way. What else is there? Right. Seems like reality itself. It, it reality itself. It's yeah. exactly that. It's reality itself. So what are you asking me to move to what? Well, this brings up an interesting point. Yeah. Uh, I think that what you're saying can bring people to um, a, a readiness to see in a different way, but they can't actually see in a different way through an act of will. Yeah. Something has to happen to them. And that thing could be a breakdown in their lives. Yep. Um, you know, it, I mean, usually I think it happens whether for individuals or society. Mm -hmm. It happens when the old story just isn't working anymore. Right. And and when it's not working anymore, not just automatically something else comes up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes and very often is the case there is a collapse, mm -hmm. and we need to come out of the ashes again. Because if the act of reflection, for whatever reason, is not present or is a possibility, then life will hit us with a big stick mm -hmm. before we even move to something else. And actually, that's my concern with the situation of the present civilization. Yes. But then, on the bright side, often after that big stick hits yeah. us and things fall apart, on the other end of it, we realize, you know, that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Yeah. What seemed like the worst case scenario yeah. from, from before, once I've gone into that and gone through that, I, I discovered capacities and resources that I just had no idea existed. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that means I grow um, and learn that reality, because if reality isn't what you thought it was, then what's possible isn't what you thought it was either. Mm -hmm. So so new capacities are discovered, and I think society will go through that too. I often say that, yeah. that you know, we don't need any new technology mm -hmm. to live in peace and harmony and, and, and enormous abundance on this planet. Yeah. Oh. We have it all. You know, yeah, we it's, do. it's not a hard thing. 
that is invisible to us yes. at the same time. Because for you to appreciate that you have all, gratitude is indispensable mm -hmm. to begin with. You once told me a story. What is? Uh, about your father and gratitude. Uh, yeah, right. I did. I loved that story, and I really, <laughs> that's, that's a medicine story. Would you be willing to share that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. When I was uh, <clears throat> five or six years old, my father used to tell me that during the war, the Civil War in Spain, he was in charge because given that he knew how to type, to type, what are you calling it in English? Yeah, he, he could type, yeah. Ty yeah, type, in, and they're all machines that we had at the time, right? And because he had that, he was in charge in the Republican, I don't know, what are you calling it, the military? But to be, to distribute the, the food and everything to the troops. So uh, he told me that he was once in a particular town, <clears throat> in, a, in a house where uh, he has his headquarters. My father was a humble man. I'm talking about uh, a small battalion or something like that. But food disappeared. They were surrounded by the Franco troops. Nothing came in, came in to eat. And uh, my father said that there were days not eating. And they began to eat rats and began to eat whatever they could. Uh, and he told me, you have no idea, son, he said to me, what hunger is. So he told me the following story then, that one day he was in the place and he had reserved, <laughs> saved, a piece of bread. And the piece of bread was hard like a rock because he ate a little bit every day, just, but he was so scared not to have anything that he kept it, kept it, kept it. Anyway, and, and in a moment, a woman from the house that was across where he was, crossed the street and asked him, Mr. Olaya, I need your help. My father is dying. I have nothing to give him. Please, do you have anything for him to eat because he's dying? And my father thought of his piece of bread and, and he was in this horrendous thing. His anger was enormous. Bread was all he had and this woman begging him to save the life of his father by feeding him with something. And in that moment, my father said, I couldn't take it. And I got it and gave the piece of bread. And the woman hugged me, kissed me, and left. And he said, that was it, my son. And, and I don't know why I did it, but my anger, my anger was so big and so forth. But anyway, it was an act. And that, he told me that story. When I was 19, I went to Spain with my father. And uh, we rented a little car. And my father guided me to drive through areas where he fought the war. And suddenly we arrived to this little town near Santander, and he said, that's the town where the story of the bread happened. Ah, I said, let's say, my father said, let's go, and we start running, I said, wow, this is the house where I was when the story took place. So we went to the house, of course the house was inhabited by some people and so forth, but by, from outside my father looked and it was, of course, an old house, and, and he said, gosh, I remember this and that, and do you recall the story? I said, I recall your story, Father. And suddenly, across the street, the door is open, and a woman came out. And the woman walked toward us, and she said, are you Mr. Olaya? My father said, yes. Do you remember me? My father said, I don't know exactly. He said, do you remember when I came to visit you because my father was dying and you gave me the bread? And my father was taken. And she hugged him in front of me. For them, I had disappeared. They hugged for I don't know how long. And that day, I understood gratitude from a place that I never Imagine it would be like that. That's the story, my friend. Mm -hmm. And I cannot remember the story without being touched by it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. When I hear stories like that, 
I say it's a medicine story. And I have the feeling that that, that choice that your father made mm -hmm. to give that bread from the rational, causal, linear standpoint, that was an insignificant act. An insignificant act. Given the deluge of suffering that engulfed Europe starting at that time. All right. You know, one piece of bread to feed one old yeah. starving man. What influence could that possibly have on the tides of history? But another aspect yeah. of my being knows that that was a significant act yeah. that ripples out through the uh, underground parts of causality yeah. through invisible, you know, it tugs on invisible threads that, that, that shift the whole universe. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's almost like those events are almost set up that way to be in the moment, to seem completely hopeless, yeah. you know, completely inconsequential. And it's just you and that person and this choice, just a bare naked yeah. choice. But actually, those are those decisions are more important than anything Barack Obama yeah. could do publicly. Yeah, yeah. What is amazing about something like that is that that story, first of all, happened when it happened. But the story lives in me, and through me, it has given food for the soul of so many people who have heard me telling the story. Mm. So independently of anything else and without any other intention, mm -hmm. the story does its work every day, yes. constantly, in ways that the only place to look is magic. Absolutely the magic of life, which from a rational perspective is nonsense altogether, but I enjoy the magic of it. So this is, before we were talking about the impossibility of changing one's worldview or the impossibility of um, knowing the things that were beyond the scope of one's knowing through will. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, I, I, I often think about, about how any teaching becomes, people try to make it into a formula Mm -hmm. where the separate self accomplishes something. Yeah. So then the question is, well, how does one change, mm -hmm. if not mm -hmm. by making a project of it? Yeah. And one way is to receive stories like this. Yeah. You hear this story, and you are not the same. Yeah. Even if you never make a declaration or a vow or a, quote, intention, yeah. you are not the same because you've received this story. Yeah. And you will make different choices. I mean, maybe the effect is small for some people, for some people, it might be big, but you will make different choices just because you've received this thing. Well, definitely the story uh, <clears throat> for me means so much. Um, the fact that I have in my, in my memory the, the scene of those two human beings hugging in silence after 30 years mm -hmm. of the event, 30 years after. And among them, there was something, a connection that was bigger than what we sometimes achieve in a whole life with anyone. Um, the, the, as I said, the magic of it, and how that story shifted me and allowed me to do what I do. In other words, the story, as you are implying, Oh, I understand from what you said, became a school of a, of a different sort. Mm -hmm. it, it, it truly was a place for learning. It, beyond any planning, beyond any idea of achieving anything. It gives me a sense of this uh, hidden intelligence in the universe, too. That's Just magic. Like how, how, you know, who arranged that, that this incident would happen, mm. that your father would tell you the story, yeah. that you would 
then go to that, that, that town and that woman would look out her window just at that moment yeah. and recognize your father what? and that this would be instrumental in you becoming um, you know, a founder of the coaching movement yeah. and, and, and bringing, I mean, like, you know, it, it is. I mean, there's my, my conditioned mind of separation says that it was a chapter of accidents. Yes, a chapter of accidents. But, <laughs> but there's another part of me that really yes. feels gratitude. Of course. Feels like I, I could not have designed this. Yeah. I could not have written such no. a story. And, and on the magic doesn't stop there if we keep looking at this. My father left Spain. He left Spain and went to France in an act of despair. Mm. He took a little boat with a group of other soldiers and abandoned that was literally leaving everything behind. And through days of navigating and how do you call it in English? Uh, rowing. Rowing and all of that, a dangerous place. They arrived in France. And when he was in France, the French told him, my dear, you cannot be in France for too long. We are in serious danger. We have a guy next door called Hitler. Things are getting really tough. We are preparing for something here. Um, so think of something. And my father thought, if I go back to Spain, I'm dead. I'm dead as man. No kidding. And he then recalled a story. And the story was that a, a nephew of my father m was living in Chile, a country that he never knew anything about it, except that one day someone told him, you have a nephew in Chile. Because his mother, sister went to live in Chile, and you know, and years and years passed. He never met them. But my father, in his despair, remembered that one day someone came in his home in Spain and said to him, you know that your nephew in Chile got married with a boxing uh, champion in Chile? Oh, and it was interesting, and everybody, oh, we have a, a, a boxing guy, a boxer, in the family, it's a But my father recalled well, that. The nephew, the nephew couldn't have married him. Uh, no, it's a niece. A niece, not a niece a, okay. Sorry, sorry, yeah. a niece. So, the, my father then got a paper and wrote a letter to the Chilean boxing champion, because he didn't even know the name of the guy. And in the letter he said, I know you're married with a niece of mine, Please give this letter to her. All I'm asking you is that you speak with anyone that you can talk to get a ticket, a passage to go to Chile. Because in France, I'm in despair, blah, blah, blah. And he said that. Put a stamp, send a letter. And no he, address or anything, right? Just it's Chilean just, box. Uh, where, what address? To right. Who? Yes. <laughs> and then, weeks after, a letter came back. And it was for his aunt, the mother of this woman, saying, we know, my dear nephew, that you are in France in this situation. We are sending you a ticket to come to Chile and, and boat, whatever. And my father got that letter and I started running all over the town. He said, it was the craziest day of my life, jumping with the letter in his hand. So he went to Chile. When my father died, I flew from the USA to Chile. And I, he had been buried, I didn't arrive on time. So I went to his room. And I started getting all his paper and I found the letter. Mm. And the letter is in my home. Mm -hmm. Framed in my home. Mm. And there's another lesson about the magic of life. Without that letter, I wouldn't be here talking with you. Mm -hmm. Without that letter, many people would have never been in touch with how many things that 
just by the mystery of my existence I've been in touch with, and on and on and on. So again, another story, another dimension of magic of life, with something else. A few years after, I went to exile. My father exiled, I am exiled, and then I begin to wonder, what is the message? Because you had to flee Pinochet. Yes. So my father has left Franco and I have I left Pinochet, but we were both excited. So one day I found myself in San Francisco wondering, what the hell is all this about? And the message came around the following, he says, there will be exile as long as we cannot accept fully that other people can see the world different than you see it. Because mm -hmm. your exile then is kind of mirroring the exiling of others by casting them into it, out of your universe. Yep. Yeah, you're not in reality, only I am. Exactly. Yeah. So the story triggers a story that triggers another one. In, in a magic sequence, mm -hmm. and for that, I'm grateful. I often uh, speak to people who are in a pretty profound state of despair over the future of the planet, mm -hmm. and, and how hopeless it is. And they might think that I'm naive Mm -hmm. um, for being optimistic yeah. and it's not that I dispute any of their evidence yeah. um, but it's that they're ignoring something yeah. and the thing that they're ignoring is this kind of magical intelligence this um, yeah this intelligence to that is within the events of our lives and um, that you could dismiss as, like, like the, the, the mind of separation has an explanation for that. Well, that was just coincidence. And the reason it seems that, that those coincidences happen more than you would expect <laughs> is merely that you only report those. Yep. You don't report the story of the time your father gave someone a piece of bread and never yep. saw them again. You don't report the mundane, you only report the extraordinary, so it makes the world seem extraordinary, but it actually isn't, sorry. Yeah. The problem with that refutation is that <clears throat> it is not actually evidence-based. It's, irref it, it's um, what's it called? A, uh, um, it's not disprovable. You, can, you could account for anything with that story. Um, you know, some of the most amazing, I mean, I've heard many magical stories too. And one by one, if you explain them away like that, it's sort of satisfying to the mind. Yeah, you know, that might've just been coincidence. Yeah, you know, lots of stories happen in war and the ones that weren't lucky, like your father, randomly lucky, they perished from the pages of history so we don't hear their stories. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can kind of construct um, or reconstruct a dead world um, by, um, you know, drawing on coincidence and things. But when you hear enough of those stories, something, at least something stirs in me when I hear enough of them. I, I, that, that, there's just this part, this part of me that says that can't be that can't be just random coincidence. Yeah. You know, a woman who's, she told me a story, she was in despair, mm -hmm. suicidal, and she goes to the, to the ocean, and she says, please, if there's anybody out there, and she was, she was in a state of desperation. Yeah. You know, like the words came out of her mouth, if, if, if there's anything out there, please give me a message, tell me that there's something out there, and nothing yeah. happens. And despondent, she just sits in the sand and puts her hand down behind her to lean on her hand 
and it, there's a hard object there. And she pulls, pulls out this gold medallion, solid gold medallion on a chain, and it says, I love you on it. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, wow. Yeah, so when we are in despair over the future of this planet, we're not taking something into account. <laughs> but it's not something we can control. Yeah. It's not something that we can fit into a formula mm -hmm. for manipulating reality and, and right. intentionally creating a future that our ego self, our small self, wants. Mm -hmm. it, so it doesn't satisfy that desire for certainty and control and security. But there's kind of a larger security, the feeling of being held for me, the feeling of being held by an inconceivably huge purpose and an unfolding that if I listen to it, I can maybe serve it. Yeah. And I want to do that because I'm in such awe and gratitude yeah. that, that such an intelligence exists. And the other thing that came to me as you speak is that when we have restricted in a thinking, the rational thinking, or the realistic thinking, so forth, uh, we, we don't look at reality from other perspective because, come on guys, we got science, we know better, it's time to give up about all this nonsense and tell But we do that because we have access now to the truth. It's just a matter of testing and right. there you go. So the price of holding now, quote, an access to the truth is that the voice, the multiple voices of the universe now are mute. We don't listen to them. And therefore, this magic disappears. But if we look at existence in itself, the act of just existing, not as human being, everything existing, that is not explained by the chemistry or the physics of any anything, at least is room to begin to think that all our thinking is insufficient to deal with this mystery. So that gold medallion that says, I love you, belongs to a place that the logic the sequence, the testing, and all of that begins to be insufficient. Yeah. I mean, of course you can say, well, obviously somebody dropped that on the beach, you know, of they took it off, they were going swimming, something yeah. like that. Of course. But that explanation doesn't invalidate anything. Anything. Yeah. It's not the point. It's, it's not that we're saying that it magically teleported there. Yeah. You know, it's just the confluence mm -hmm. of circumstances. Yeah. The, the fact that we have stopped listening to the universe, to nature, and so forth, has created in us going back to the issue of solitude, because there are no other voices, only human voices, no other voices, which and remember our friend who spoke about the fact that we can only be human when we are in contact with that that is not human. <laughs> that, that in some moment when we stop truly walking in the trees, not to analyze the composition of the tree, but rather to be with them, there's a different knowing that takes place there's a different message that we can listen. But those walks are now less often done, and therefore those voices are not feeding who we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, the expression I use is that we stop being in touch with the magic of existence. And I don't know if the word is magic, mysterious, I don't know, it doesn't yeah. matter, but wonder, awe, mm -hmm. is gone, and those little stories, or big stories, depends how you judge them, bring back awe, mm -hmm. 
at least being brought, they, they bring back questions all new that we need to ask that will feed us. It doesn't matter if we answer them or not, that's not my point. But it's going back to the fact that what is this phenomenon called existence? Is that explained by any of that? What, what, what truly is this beyond all the stories we can invent? Why we grew so, so dramatically arrogant about what we know. How did we get there? In which moment we develop such an arrogance that now we have the way to go there, to the truth, and that is above anything. Well, what, what was that? In which moment? One of my friends <clears throat> was told by a uh, shaman in Africa, there are, there are no facts, there are only stories. That essentially the building blocks of reality are not <laughs> things, but they are stories. Sure. So I, it's kind of like, it's what you've, it's another way of saying what you've been saying is that We've always lived in a story, every culture lives in a story, but the difference between us and the other cultures is that our story says we don't live in a story. Yeah. But nonetheless, that's still a story. Yeah. The story that the scientific method is based on, yeah. which says that there's an objective, testable reality outside yeah. of ourselves yeah. that's independent of the observer. Yeah. Like, that is a metaphysical assumption. Yeah. That's not scientific. No. It's, 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 it's a doctrine. It's a doctrine. So the question then is, in that story, like what, what is possible from that story? What is impossible? What does that story do to you when you inhabit it? What can you create from that? What yeah. can you not create from that? And we see all around us the results of that story. It is a powerful story for certain types of creation. But as you were saying today, um, one thing that has not brought us is happiness. Yeah. Oh. Just that, oh wow, can you tell that story about the, uh, the, the, um, the rich people in, the, in that seminar? That, that was really... Ah, the, the seminar that I was hired to... Because you say like, you, you find everywhere you go, yeah. you find one thing in common among all civilized people, which is what? Suffering. Suffering. Suffering, and a suffering that we do our best to cover. Let's get to work, let's get... A suffering that is so disguised in so many tricks we play. Uh, but the story I was telling is that I was hired by a university, I would keep the, the, the name of the university, to work for six days with a group of people that in order to be there, they have to have, I don't know, a hundred million dollars, something, a personal wealth, something like that. And of course, when they hire me, the conditions to lead that program were that I didn't know the name of the participants, except a first name, but I couldn't know their full names. I had to sign an agreement that I would never ask them for anything. And, um, and therefore, when I signed that, only when I signed that, I was officially hired to do the job. And when I worked with them, what I found is the same suffering with other shapes, other character, all that, a deep, deep suffering. And then a question came. The illusion of our time is I get to that level of wealth, I should be happy. What an illusion. And a lot of political dialogue, even on the left, says that the world is divided between the vast number of victims and the oppressed, and then the few who are the beneficiaries yep. of the system. But if being a beneficiary means means this deep suffering that yep. you're talking about, like you're talking soul level suffering, yep. Yep. Uh, is that really a beneficiary? <laughs> you know, I mean, what's the suicide rate among 
those people. I don't think the depression rate. Is, yeah. Well, the depression rate. I remember some of them uh, went to uh, a profound pain, and the pain was nobody approached me for who I am. Mm -hmm. That was one of the biggest. Everybody who approached me, I know, is because of my money. For instance, that. Uh, that's only one, but. And uh, living that thinking, that story, with 100 million in your pocket, doesn't change the story, only reinforces the story. And there we go. The next step for that person is going there, out there to do business to get more. Mm -hmm. Right, because if what you're doing doesn't work, it must be because you're not doing enough of it. Exactly. So we see the same thing across the spectrum. And, and what you were talking about before, the, um, the muting of the voices of non-human beings, of other than human beings, of nature, yeah. of the land, um, which of course has extended to the indigenous, to the animals, to the plants. Right. Um, the muting of those voices means that concepts like respecting nature we hear them as not fully taking it seriously. We hear them kind of as these poetic tropes. Yes, exactly. But ultimately, what is there to respect when it's just a bunch of building blocks? Yeah. So really, respect for nature, the scientific or the rational programmed mind says, well, really what we mean is more cleverly manipulating these building blocks so that we don't destroy ourselves. These resources. Resources, yes, resources. So. You know, you, you look at, at, at you know, climate change policy and stuff, it's about reducing a measurable number yeah. called greenhouse gas equivalents. Yes. Uh, that, and, and the solution then is, you know, that, that it's like you were saying, it's a change of action. Yeah. But it's not a change of perception. It's not. The change of perception, well, there's level after level of it. Yeah. And one level is happening. I'll give it, I'll, like, we have yeah. to give credit where credit is due. The level of, like, the old perception that we don't depend on nature, we can end the endlessly engineer substitutes for the resources that nature gives us. That story is falling apart. Yeah. But the deeper story is still, still needs to fall apart. The deeper story that nature does consist of resources, that it doesn't have its own beingness, intelligence, voice, awareness, consciousness, that is... That is separated from us. Yes. So we don't see that the woods are not separated from me. We are one in a bigger dance. It's only that we don't see the bigger dance. So what is, when we talk, when we listen to the voices of that, we're talking our, our own voices in some way, but in a different space and context. I am not separated from that place or the ocean or the air. I am one with it. It's only that I have the illusion that I exist by myself. But my, what is by myself? I'm breathing every moment. I'm exchanging everything with everything. Not only in a physical level, in every other level. In this conversation, look what's happening here. Who is you, who is me? Yeah. In which way, oh, this is just you and now it's just me. We are completely separated. Or we are building something that is in this distinguishable, you or I. So that illusion of separateness is also part of that story. Yes. And if we don't change the story, then we deal with nature as if we need to, quote, protect it. Because right. we need the resources. Yeah. Again, I don't dispute the goodwill behind that thought. That's. But it's not revolutionary. No. It's not, it's part of the same observer, but it's an observer with goodwill. Let's put it that Right, but we've always been observers with goodwill, yeah. imagining ourselves to be. Yeah. Yeah. So you're uh, now 70 years old. Yes. And would you say that you are more optimistic or 
about the future of this planet or the condition of this planet or less than you were 30 years ago? I think I'm more optimistic. Uh, 30 years ago and little before when I came to exile and I left, remember the, the world we live at that time was uh, the bad communist side and the good capitalist side, and that was the division of the planet. Yes. That division disappeared, uh, but at that time, Chile was r r moving into the bad guys, mm -hmm. and therefore the whole thing is, for me it was hopeless somehow because of the power. We were little pieces in, in a huge machinery of power, the Soviet Union, and, and the United States, and all that moved there. At that time, my desire, my biggest desire, was social justice. That was the top of my wishes, social justice. Mm -hmm. It wasn't there yet, the concern for the planet, or the concern, right. no, not yet. It was social justice, and that was it. And the social, the looking for social justice was about accusing the other guys. Mm -hmm. That was the, pretty much the mechanic of the. Which planet. is the same mentality. I mean, it's the mentality of conquering evil. Yep. The world would be a better place if we can finally conquer evil. Exactly. Yeah. So we were again within the same story, and the story of the Soviet Union, the story of the Americans. Maybe a little bit different here and there, but the fundamental pieces, indisputable. Both want to grow, wants to conquer nation. Yeah. Once they believe that happiness is about wealth, one is for everybody, the other one is not so much for everybody, but sharing a little bit of it. <laughs> but if you look at that, fundamentally at the end, at the bottom line, there was not much difference if you look at it. Uh, this quote, John Kenneth Galbraith, the economist, he said, capitalism is a system in which man exploits man. In communism, it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly with <what> fun. <laughs> right, that's what I'm referring to. It's a good quote, I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but when, when the whole thing collapsed, and I found myself, as I said, reflecting on the issue of what the hell is life? What I'm doing here? Why is this dispute in which I've been involved so strongly? And that's, what is the meaning of the whole thing? I, I truly collapsed mm -hmm. with the end of the, the Cold War. And I have to revise every presupposition I ever had, but I never saw those as presuppositions. Of course, I saw them like that's the way things were. That moment, a humility, a profound humility visited me. Mm -hmm. Profound. I love the way you say that. A profound humility visited you. It's not something that you can achieve, is it? No. no. Nope. I had to ask questions from a place which was not about to accuse anyone. I had to visit history from a place of acceptance, which is different than a place of liking it or not. Mm -hmm. It's simply to accept, using Wilbur's work, accept history in order to transcend it. Um, those moments when the whole thing collapsed, the whole Cold War collapsed, mm -hmm. I wonder about that. For instance, remember that before that, there was this whole thing about the nuclear. Oh yeah, remember it well. <sighs> yeah. Well, something there began to change, not completely, but mm -hmm. somehow. It's an important change because <clears throat> The Soviet Union was, you know, that division between communism and capitalism, yeah. that was the last time that our civilization had a really believable yeah. story of the evil other. Exactly. You know, now we, after that collapse, then we had the drug lords, and now it's the terrorists or Islam, yeah. but no one really believes yes. 
no one really believes that Islam is such a big threat. Yeah. You know, it gets all hyped up yeah. and, and, and it kind of superficially satisfies our need for a threat yeah. to unite us. But people are not as like fundamentally terrified yeah. of Islam as they were of the Soviet Union. I mean, that was, I mean, I remember the map there's the United States this big, and the Soviet Union that big, yeah. and the nuclear missiles. I mean, it was it was full on. Wow. And so we have a crisis now. Um, uh, we don't have a bigger evil in front of yeah. us. Yeah, and that's a crisis okay. for a mentality that runs the world based yes. on finding the enemy. Yes, and I remember that in me. What gave, gave me strength was fighting with these selfish guys. Right that the military were represented and, and the, the uh, undisputably the good guys were us. Yes. And there was no way not to see that. That was clear. Of course, they thought about the same thing. Of course. <laughs> Unfortunately, the same thing. <laughs> exactly the same thing. So, so that's what I said. It requires a deep humility. We, we had to receive the visitors of the visit of humility to truly give ourselves permission to begin to wonder, to ask new questions, to truly realize that the, the I don't know that I was facing was I don't know so large, so huge, that there was no a little place for pretense. Mm -hmm. I don't know was brutally large. And only when the, that I don't know was established, I was able to begin to look at my learning from a different place. My learning didn't come from where it was coming before. It didn't mean what it meant before. It, had, it didn't have the, the shape that it had before. It was not an accusative learning. Mm -hmm. um, I had to truly rescue or maybe reinvent the meaning of learning in a way that I never ever thought before. Never. It didn't even occur to me that learning could have that dimension. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, wrap up our recording soon, but yeah. really like that feels like a, a potent message that um, that actually fills me with kind of excitement for the future, which is be ready for a learning that is beyond anything you can imagine. Exactly. Anything we <clears throat> can imagine. I actually, when I think of all this tradition in the planet of wisdom, doesn't matter how you call it, could come from Buddhism, could come from Lao Tse, could come from, it doesn't matter, you call it the way you want. The place where those guys were listening from had nothing to do with the way today we hold learning. They, they were completely foreign to dominating nation producing more stuff, gathering wealth, or anything of that sort. They were looking into a, diff a completely different place. I'm not saying that place is the only place to look, I'm, but I said there's a message there that we must listen. Not because they now are going to give us the truth, a new, but rather a place to dwell. And, and that, that is speaking louder and louder to me. And I'm not talking only about the Eastern. I'm talking about our native people. I'm talking about, for instance, the Polynesian people. Mm -hmm. There's so much wisdom there. And when the, the yes. European, the French, arrive there, and, and, and this, you know, I think it's important to emphasize that neither of us are ever saying that we should discard scientific no. or technology or reality testing or anything like that. No, neither for a minute. The problem is that, that those ways of interacting with 
the world have exceeded their proper domain. Exactly. And we try to apply those to everything. Everything. And, and therefore marginalize and exclude things that have a value and we put them in a box. Like even when you say, you know, Polynesian wisdom or indigenous wisdom yeah. or something like that, like we have kind of a tidy little box for that. Yeah. Where we treat it as it's almost this kind of cultural fetish object. Yes. You know, oh, it, oh yes, we must respect it because, yeah. you know, we shouldn't dominate other people anymore. But, but this kind of patronizing quotation marks respect yeah. is very different from receiving it at yeah. face value yeah. as as something no less no more but no also more. no less than no less valid no less powerful i keep saying that constantly i'm not saying they are better we are worse that's not my point is the capacity to listen to other voices mm -hmm. that's all i'm saying and to 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 dismiss the arrogance that we have the way to get to the truth, the only way. And we have, we're so lucky that we are the one who have that, which is called science. More than science, it's scientism, not science. Mm -hmm. yeah. Science I respect, it, but scientism is the point, that religion. It's hard to listen to other voices when you have been immersed your whole life in an ideology that says that those other voices don't exist, mm -hmm. that you're inventing them so, I mean, I have that, you know, if I'm in some kind of workshop and they say, okay, you know, go to the tree and put your hands on the tree yeah. and listen to what the tree is saying to you. I know that, I'm, so part of me knows that I have that capacity. Yeah. All human beings do. Yeah. But another part of me is saying, you're wasting your time. Yeah. If you hear anything, you're making it up. Uh, it's just some woody tissue. Yeah. It doesn't have a voice. You can't yeah. hear anything. And, and when that chatter is there, and, and, it, and there's an emotional aspect to it too. Right. A feeling of, of having been betrayed, a feeling of having been crushed, yeah. this, a fear that that will happen again mm -hmm. if I am so foolish as to open up to this. Yeah. Uh, so like, so, and I'm sure that you would say that there's a, there's a somatic well, dimension to that as well, um, yeah. of being closed and contained. Right. So I, I remember uh, my mother, uh, became, she's now close to be 92, but when she was 90, uh, I took her to uh, some woods in southern Chile where there are trees of 800, 1,000 years old, something like that. And I walk with her slowly as she can walk right now. And I was just being with her, and usually I talk with her about old memories because it's easy for mm -hmm. her to go there. And suddenly we get to a tree that I had been there before, that is around 850 years according to the reports I have. It's a beautiful, beautiful tree. And I said to my mother, do you see that tree, Mom? She said, yeah, it's beautiful. You know, Mom, that is 850 years old? And she looked at me and said, come on, I can know you. She said, yeah, Mom. She... So she walked to the tree and I said, no word, and she hugged the tree. Mm. And I took a picture of my mother hiding the tree. The peace in her face. The surrenderness that I saw in her. I had not seen her in, in my mother ever before. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a silent moment. I don't remember how long she was there. She was hiding and there. And then she separated from the tree, hold my hand, and we keep walking. But definitely in that moment, something was manifested. And, and I saw in my mother something that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. Something majestic, that's the only way I have, took place in the most simple step of a walk. I had no idea. I don't know how to speak about that, but it was so into my heart. And when I see the picture that I have of my mother hugging the tree, it's very difficult not to move, not to be moved by it, because of the, the surrender. Yeah. The surrender that I saw in her. She and when, like, I, mm -hmm. when I hear stories like that, mm -hmm. I feel the presence of an invitation 
from the old story that despite 30 or 40 years of work still operates in me, which wants to kind of discount that as the self-comforting delusions of an old lady yep. uh, who's imagining that the tree is, right? Like there's that whole very, very pained yeah. cynic. Um, and But that story is an invitation to me um, into a world where I can see the majesty yeah. of that. And one thing... And I get those invitations again and again and right? again, and I think how many times will it take <laughs> for me to step fully back. step into that yeah. forever? You know one thing, just for you to know, my mother was not reflecting about the act of hanging the tree. She did not have a story. Mm -hmm. She's not in that situation in her life where mm -hmm. she's building a kind of metaphysical story of any sort. Something called her. I have no clue because I just only told her that mm -hmm. tree I've been told is 850 years old. That was it. And she said, simply walk with me and go again. She was close to the tree, left my hand, hide the tree, but there were no it was nothing. A primal response of her unconditioned mind. Yeah, that it yeah. was. It was nothing like, oh, okay, I want to hire a tree in order to connect. Right, nothing, right. Uh -huh, nothing, uh -huh. nothing of that. And when she left the tree, she didn't talk about it either. Yes, that's an important data point. <laughs> it's yes. important. Yeah. There was there was nothing, nothing that I can say about it. Do you remember when you had the tree? What tree? What she said. Mm -hmm. But the moment, the moment I got it in my soul, watching her. I remember that I, I was I couldn't believe my eyes by the peace I saw in her face that I hadn't seen probably in her own life. Mm -hmm. My mother has another story, a very painful yeah. one. Wow. Well mm. I'm, I'm I feel grateful to the uh, absurdly unlikely sequence of events that's led us to, <laughs> to be to together here. Yeah. Right. And I just give thanks to that. Yeah, me to too. To that organizing intelligence. Me too. I'm very grateful of this possibility to be together and chat a little bit. And this afternoon, when we get together for the closing, who knows where mm. we will be headed? Who knows? <laughs> who knows? Well, this has been uh, Charles Eisenstein speaking with Julio Alaya founder of the Newfield Network and a dear friend. You've been listening to A New and Ancient Story with me, your host, Charles Eisenstein. To engage more deeply, you can join our community on newandancientstory.net, where we have live chats, forums, meetups, and all kinds of other tools for collaboration. If you want to find out more about my work, then visit my website, charleseisenstein.net.